Welcome back, Left Reckoners. Stoked uh, to be here for this Sunday show with Matt Leck and our good friend, Gene Bajlon. Gene Bajlon, y'all know him, TMBS Forever crew, our good friend, also a professor of history at Missouri State University. You also know him from T This Is Revolution. And uh, uh, from this piece, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, in Jacobin Magazine, the Kurdish struggle is at the heart of the protests in Iran. Uh, Gene, brother, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Matt and David. Well, we're going to, I, we want to start on the nutritious side and about the importance of, of this social struggle. Just reminding folks, uh, we are also going to talk about why everything is not a fucking uh, color revolution. And I couldn't imagine someone better to do this with than Gene. But before we get into dunking on some of the weirder uh, folks out there, um, you know, we had a Saul Rod on the program uh, last week, and if people missed that, you should definitely uh, check that interview out, um, talking about the, the struggle and the protests um, in Iran. Um, but one aspect that we didn't talk about because we knew Gene was going to be on the program this week uh, was the Kurdish um, aspect, because um, for folks who don't know, uh, the young woman who was killed uh, was Kurdish and was visiting Tehran. Um, and I think that for people who might not know uh, the um, ins and outs of kind of like Iranian society, history and politics, they might not know why that has, uh, you know, why that means a lot uh, for these protests. So, Gene, you know, could you, um, you know, talk a little bit about what this uh, Kurdish aspect, um, you know, her, her being Kurdish, like adds to these social protests that, that we've been seeing in Iran? Of course. So, you know, when we think of Iran, obviously, we think of the dominant cultural group, the Persian community. Uh, but Iran is an extremely diverse uh, country. It's made up of you know, Persians, but also several other national minorities. For example, in the South e uh, Southeast, you have the Baluchi minority. Uh, you have a large Turkish community. You have an Arab community in the Southwest. And you have the Kurdish community uh, in the Northwest of the country. So Iran has a significant degree of ethno-national diversity. And in addition, when we talk about the Persian community, there are also several very strong regional identities as well. Um, Iran as a country, you know, often is portrayed as this ancient country with a mm -hmm. continuous history. But in terms of the modern era, Iran uh, was relatively late in terms of its uh, phase of national integration. So, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, there was a relatively vigorous process of, in, uh, of centralization in the 19th century. But in Iran, that pro process was far more lethargic. Uh, Iran was historically had a smaller population, less resources to call, uh, call upon. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, Iran was uh, a highly fragmented country. There had been some attempts by the Qajar dynasty to integrate the country, but these were relatively weak and, you know, in many parts of the country, there were tribal groups who were largely autonomous. And, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, the situation, there was no modern state. And that modern state that we talk about in Iran was really a product of the 20th century. You had uh, the rise of the Pahlavi dynasty that overthrew the Qajar dynasty. And in the 1920s and 30s, there was a vigorous process of uh, centralization engaged with, by the, the government. And this was aided by the royalties that were beginning to come in from oil. So the, the, the Pahlavi regime, which came, came to power, was able to pursue centralization. Now, this, of course, took the form of administrative centralization, breaking the back of tribal groups that had enjoyed a significant degree of autonomy. Some of those tribal groups were, of course, uh, uh, Persian tribes or Persian-speaking tribes, but some, of course, were from amongst the national minorities. And the national minorities in the country tend to live along the edges of the country. Mm -hmm. Iran is kind of like a bowl. And, you know, the Kurds are one of those minorities. And historically, Kurds have been one of the more militant uh, minorities in the country for a variety of historical reasons, partly because the Kurdish community uh, spreads out from Iran into uh, uh, the former Ottoman Empire, which today, you know, Ottoman Kurdistan, 
was divided between Iraq, Turkey, Syria. Uh, and so uh, uprisings and intellectual ideas coming from outside of Iran uh, impacted the Kurdish community, but also because of the Shia nature of the uh, Iranian state. And this is particularly pronounced after the 1979 revolution when Iran becomes an Islamic uh, republic. Um, but the Kurdish community um, be, you know, begins to uh, agitate for autonomy and self-rule within uh, within Iran in the 20th century. Uh, under the Shah, there, there, there is a, a move not only to politically centralize the country, but also to impose a unified national culture. As with many nation-building uh, processes, this involved the suppression of uh, minority languages, the suppression of minority cultural practices. And basically, the concept of Iran and Iranianism is mm -hmm. increasingly synonymized with Persian culture. So the ruling elite in Iran increasingly, uh, you know, begins to identify with a created notion of a unified Iranian identity, which is kind of a cover for Persian national chauvinism. Now, the position of all the different minorities in Iran is different, different, you know, there's different historical relations. For example, the Turkish minority in the country, although has got, it has gone through periods of nationalist uh, feeling, is also a relatively economically privileged uh, community. Uh, Turkish groups were, well, basically modern Iran in many ways was a construction not of Persians, but of Turks. The Safavid dynasty that converted the country to Shiism was a Turkic dynasty. The Qajar dynasty of the 19th century was a Turkic dynasty. And the northwestern uh, province of Iran, Azerbaijan, not to be confused with the Republic of Azerbaijan, the Republic of Azerbaijan basically took the name Azerbaijan in 1905 because they needed to come up with a name. That province, for example, is historically one of the more economically advanced and developed parts of the country. Um, and uh, Turks were relatively uh, uh, well integrated into the ruling structures, not to say that there was not a wrangling mm -hmm. about Persian chauvinism. But groups like Baluchas and Kurds and Arabs tended to be more marginalized. Uh, within this nation building process. And so we see uh, like several important tribal rebellions, some of which begin to adopt the language of nationalism in the eight, late 19th and early 20th century. But really, you know, a critical moment for the Kurdish movement in Iran is the um, formation of the Republic of Mahabad in uh, 1947. Uh, during the first, Second World War, the Shah of Iran basically was deposed by the uh, Soviets and the British. They um, saw him as being too pro-German and they invaded the country. And in the power vacuum that, uh, that ensued, there was an autonomous republic established in Azerbaijan province. And one of the byproducts of that, because Azerbaijan province is predominantly Turkish, uh, the adjacent region is a predominantly Kurdish region, and that led uh, 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 to the proclamation of an autonomous, not, not a secessionist, but an autonomous Kurdish republic in uh, uh, the town of Mahabad. And that experiment uh, drew in, for example, uh, rebels from Kurdish Iraq, who crossed the border to support the Republic, and lasted for about 11 months before it was suppressed by uh, the, the re-exertion of central authority in the country. And so during the time of the Shah, uh, there's an excellent book on it by the scholar Abbas Wali, we see below the surface in Iran uh, a percolation of Kurdish political activism, which explodes in the 1970s first as part of the movement to remove the Shah. There are two main political parties. There's the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iran, uh, which has a common origin with the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iraq, but, um, bo uh, but developed in a kind of more left 
nationalist orientation under the leadership of Abdul Rahman Qasimlu. And then you have a more explicitly Marxist party, the Komala, the organization uh, for uh, toilers uh, in Kurdistan. And these two parties, you know, joined the coalition uh, to overthrow the Shah. But once the revolution occurs, they also are some of the first groups to oppose the uh, rise of the Islamic Republic. A lot of the Iranian left basically capitulated to the Islamists during the revolution, largely, um, in my opinion, because they saw the Islamic revolution as what we might call the bourgeois democratic revolution. So they believed that uh, this revolution would bring uh, liberal democracy to Iran and they would be able to organize and develop uh, within a democratic framework. Uh, Kurds did not see things in the same way, partly because they were not Shia, so that, well, or at least the majority of the Kurds are not Shia. There are important Shia communities amongst the Kurds in Iran. But uh, Kurds were very suspicious of this, and you know, after the regime had secured power in Tehran, basically Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan, becomes the first real battlefield of the Iranian revolution as the Islamists uh, who came to power seek to consolidate their hold over the country. And so, you know, the, the dictatorship of the Islamic Republic is really consummated in, uh, in Kurdistan. And, you know, Kurds struggle in Iran throughout the 1980s, aided by Saddam Hussein, who, you know, obviously Saddam is supporting the Kurds in Iran and Iran is supporting the Kurds in Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. But once the war comes to an end, Basically, most of these groups are forced into exile. Some of them go to Ira uh, stay in Iraqi Kurdistan. And you know, after the 1991 uh, Kurdish uprising and the creation of the Kurdish Autonomous Region, basically, there's a kind of tacit agreement where the Iranian government is like, okay, you keep these guys here in their camps, make sure that they don't do any cross-border operations and we will leave you alone. Uh, some go to Europe. Uh, uh, but in Europe, the Iranian government, you know, sends agents. They murder Abdul Rahman Qasimlu. They murder uh, in 1989, and uh, a couple of years later, they murder uh, a, a number of other leaders of the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iran. And so, sort of that phase of the movement comes to an end. But in the 90s, with liberalization, we see the emergence of uh, new civil society organizations focused around issues rather than. Mm -hmm around an explicit nationalism, as well as the emergence of Pejak, which is a, uh, a kind of offshoot of the PKK in Turkey, which engages in armed struggle to a certain degree against the Islamic Republic as well. But largely, you know, during the 90s and 2000s, the, 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 the locus of uh, activity in the Kurdish region rallies behind, for example, supporting the reform movement and engaging in civil society activities. It should be noted that the Islamic Republic, to a certain degree, allowed some space for Kurdish culture and language to be, uh, uh, you know, taught within a very controlled uh, framework. But by and large, control over Kurdistan was achieved through military means and through military uh, control. And partly, you know, it was... It, you know, Iranian influence was not just in Iranian Kurdistan, but also spread into mm. Iraqi Kurdistan as well, where the Iranian government had a lot of pull and leeway over the Kurdish political parties there, which it supported. Uh, you know, at times, some of the Iraqi Kurdish political parties had assisted the Iranian government in suppressing, uh, you know, Kurdish activism in Iran. For example, the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iraq in the 80s uh, helped attack Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iran bases during the war. So it's a whole mess. But um, in particular, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, which is the party of the former Iraqi president, Jalal Talabani, uh, and controls the city and province of Suleimani, that, that party, although uh, 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 ostensibly a sort of secular nationalist party, has particularly strong relations with the Islamic Republic with the Revolutionary Guard uh, because, you know, they, they have a border with mm. Iran and, and, you know, it's very important for them to maintain good relations with the Iranian government. So basically we have uh, 
in Iranian Kurdistan, we have you know a, a, a situation like in the rest of the country, where there is economic crisis, uh, and Kurdistan in particular is a relatively it's not the poorest part of Iran, but it's relatively underdeveloped. Uh, you know, there's a, for example, a lot of the people who are arrested and killed by the Iranian government, they're involved in the drug trade, for example, they're involved in smuggling across into Iraqi Kurdistan. That's a product of the poverty of the region because, you know, Kurds are disproportionately rendered to the reserve army of labor in Iran. Uh, but obviously these issues are compounded by the question of national oppression. So when we see these protests breaking out uh, in Iran, for many, you know, Persians and other, you know, people in the core of the Iranian state, you know, th this is a question of liberal democratic rights and uh, an end to a kind of oppressive regime. And those factors come into play in the Kurdish region, but they are like exacerbated by the question of national oppression and mm -hmm. the particularity of the way that Iranian state power is exercised in Kurdistan. You know, I mean, thank you for that. That was, that I think is really helpful because I think a lot of Americans actually like, it's not accidental, by the way, why it's like this. They they, they think of like Iran and, and Persia, you know, being Persian, for example, as being, you know, interchangeable, which is not the the case. And, you know, I will tell you, like, that is something that you will be quickly corrected on <laughs> uh, when you talk to talk to folks, if, if you do make that mistake. Um, but I mean, I want to talk about like some of the, the contemporary stuff, but you know, setting the stage too. I think trying to help people understand the dynamics there, I think is, is, is worthwhile. And like, you know, one of the things that I think is, is worth noting is that despite what you might think, because people obviously so associate like mandatory hijab, um, you know, with being very, very religious, um, you know, in, in Tehran, it's like, it's much stronger, like the enforcement of these kind of things. And this was part of the, the reason, at least from what I've, I've read and heard from folks, um, you know, that, that exacerbated this problem is like, you know, this young woman is visiting Tehran from, you know, from, from where she lives, where it's not as intense, not as strict. And it's also changed over time, even in Tehran, um, how strict the, the hijab is in, enforced. Um, but for people to understand that, like, you know, this is somebody coming to visit, you know, the capital city and, um, you know, maybe not fully understanding like how strict these kind of rules um, are. Uh, when you come into a, a big place, I mean, you know, imagine going to New York and like people who aren't from New York City, they do the wrong things all the time. You know, they don't get on the subway right, things like that. You know, understand that this exacerbates, you know, this national um, question uh, a, a lot. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen, especially since the rise of the Raisi uh, government, is a kind of hard turn in the enforcement of some of the uh, strictures of the Islamic Republic. At various points, there's been moves towards liberalization. And then at various points, there's been reactions against it, especially when the hardliners uh, come to power. So there's definitely been, I think, a shift. And, mm -hmm. you know, on a broader level, the existence of the Ishadi, the, the, the you know, guidance police as an arm of the security forces, you know, most encounters people have with them don't end up mm -hmm. with you getting killed. But, you know, it is a constant source of fear amongst the population, what the results might be, whether it will end in a beating, in a rape, in a murder. And so, you know, I was talking to someone the other day, we are talking hypothetically, it's like, look, if they pick up a thousand people uh, in a week and only a hundred of those people face some kind of physical violence. Well, obviously the vast majority of the encounters are not ending in violence, but one in 10 chance, not a great chance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it creates a stifling political uh, atmosphere. So women who are affected by all the same economic and uh, issues facing the rest of uh, the country have upon them placed a, an additional fear and burden, which is the strictures of the Islamic Republic. Now, these might not be as bad, for example, as what goes on in Saudi Arabia, but you know, 
it really doesn't it doesn't make a difference to you whether you're like when if you if <laughs> yeah. you say to them it's like well it's worse in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia it's like well that's great but I don't live in Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia so that doesn't really help me much it's still but that's not, not really a model baseline that you yes. want to be judging things by right <laughs> yeah I'll shut up then <laughs> yeah so the I mean and there's also a big contradiction in that you know the Islamic Republic uh, has in some ways provided, you know, with, with gender segregation, it creates new institutions that require women to staff those institutions. So at the same time as you're, you know, as, at the same time as you're post, you know, you're imposing a strict uh, uh, Islamic code on the country, women are being integrated into the workforce, mm -hmm. women are being educated. So, you know, this is a kind of circle that the Islamic Republic has a problem squaring so these these contradictions have kind of become unbearable for certain sections uh, of the population especially young people who are chafing under what is at its core a reactionary right-wing capitalist oligarchy the fact that it's kind of a counter hegemonic power doesn't change the fundamental character of the regime the iranian revolution did not transform the relations of production in Iran, uh, what happened was the locus of uh, power shifted from one section of the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. to another section of the bourgeoisie. Uh, you know, particularly the traditional merchant class, which historically has had strong relations with the Shia clergy. Uh, and you know, what are you know? There were radical socialistic elements of the Iranian Revolution, but these were concessions to the fact that the left was powerful and in the 90s and 2000s a lot of these things got reversed we see economic liberalization we see Ahmadinejad uh, we see Rouhani all engaging in mm -hmm. attempts at neoliberalization and uh, removing some of the subsidies that had existed during wartime and things like that so you know people are sick of you know a lot of people are sick of the regime we've seen uh, in 2019, for example, waves of strikes. We've we've seen periodic outbursts of uh, discontent across uh, the country. So you know this regime is by no means you know looking from the Iranian perspective, despite its revolutionary rhetoric and origin, it is in essence a right wing regime. And that's you know a lot of decolonization is it ends up that way. It ends up with a right wing nationalist regime one which mobilizes the discourse of anti-imperialism in a cultural sense, but that seeks to maintain the capitalist relations of production yeah. and, and become a powerful capitalist state. Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert, but isn't this France Fanon talking about Algeria? I mean, yeah, Franz Fanon uh, uh, talks about this. We actually recently did an episode on Franz Fanon uh, in which this issue was directly addressed in terms of what you know what happens with decolonization if you don't have a transformation in the uh, economic structure of society decolonization becomes a right wing political project and whatever concessions to socialism are made are tactical concessions and eminently reversible whether that was you know we see that in syria with the shift towards ne neoliberalization prior to the civil uh, Syrian civil war. We see that in Iran. And, you know, the, this economic transformation is often connected to issues of national security. Rouhani wrote a, 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 a book about the importance of liberalizing and its connection to national security as mm -hmm. well. So we have, we have a right-wing capitalist oligarchy um, running the country. And we have an increasingly... Um, a, a society that is increasingly divided between the rich and the poor, because one of the outcomes of sanctions is often it strengthens the regime internally because you end up with all channels of trade and interaction and intercourse with the outside world being controlled by the yes. state, which allows those who have access to connections in the state, uh, for example, to have you know access to a cheap exchange rate for US dollars, Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the rest of the population is gradually proletarianized and pauperized as a result of this, you know, as a result of this economic 
uh, crisis, which has a kind of contradictory effect on the regime, weakens it in some ways, but strengthens it in others. Well, I, I want to get into that that question of imperialism a little bit more, but before we do that, um, I, d I did want to, you know, make sure that that we're really highlighting like the character of, of these protests. And I don't know if you've seen this uh, uh, Zizek um, response. Zizek is, you know, could be hit or miss sometimes on these things, but I think it was a pretty interesting way of, of framing it. I'm curious what you think here. Your struggle has literally, this is not a rhetorical exaggeration, world historical importance because it serves a lesson also to us in the so-called developed West. We have our own feminism. In its predominant form, it is the so-called politically correct Me Too feminism, where it is clear that it mostly attracts and mobilizes middle class, upper middle class women. It solicits them to assert their specific identity, mostly excluding opposing men, while your struggle in Iran is precisely a feminist protest which immediately includes also men. Men know well that the oppression of women in Iran also involves their own oppression, that Iranian men will not be really free without the full freedom of women. We, mostly in the West, men in the West, we don't know this. Second thing, the victim was a Kurdish young woman. But again, it's not that now Kurds want identity, their specific way of life. No, it became clear to Iranians that the oppression of Kurds is just a moment of the general political oppression in Iran. Without freedom for the Kurdish people. I assume he's about to say there's no freedom for, for everyone else in, in the country. But um, I mean, I'm curious what you uh, take from, from that, Gene, because like um, from, from where I'm sitting, I mean, I think one thing that's really notable, especially for people who might be a little bit more unfamiliar um, with Iran is like the the outcry has really cut across a lot of different groups. And it is notable in a country like Iran that one, there is outrage like this over the death of, of, a, of a young woman and also notably of the death of like a young Kurdish person. But I'm curious um, if, if you agree with that, that kind of understanding of the, of the movement. Well, I think there's a, a lot of different dynamics in play and I wouldn't, you know, hazard a guess exactly what dynamics are in play. There are different groups in Iranian society mm -hmm. that have different interests and different interpretations of, uh, for example, you have the slogan, women, life, freedom. Now the slogan, women, life, freedom comes out of the Kurdish movement in Turkey and was really concretized in Syria. Uh, and mm. we see uh, one of the aspects of the Kurdish movement in Turkey, especially in the 1990s, was a shift away from traditional Marxism towards a kind of eclectic mix of eco-socialism, feminism, anarchism. And because, you know, so much of the last, you know, 50 years in the Middle East has been the rise of reactionary regimes and the destruction of the left, a lot of the, you know, one of the few places where some kind of mass left movement exists is still in the Kurdish regions of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, the one Kurdish region of the Middle East where there is no left is Iraqi Kurdistan, where the nationalists actually won. But in Turkey and, and in Syria, there is a vigorous left movement. And, you know, those ideas of placing the women's struggle at the center of uh, a 
a, a struggle for liberation have obviously been transferred to the Kurdish region and are transferring to the rest of Iran because, you know, a slogan, women, life and freedom resonates with, I think, a lot of Iranian women who are feeling oppressed. Now, the the woman, life, freedom, you know, uh, in Kurdish, Jinjian Azadi, um, has its origins in a radical anti-capitalist movement, but as a slogan, and you know, some people may disagree with me, it's very easy to appropriate by uh, lots of groups. The strength of it as a slogan is it, it is that people can, uh, you know, impart on it what they want to believe. So I do think there is a radical aspect to uh, an understanding of this, but I also think there is a kind of uh, liberal uh, aspect mm -hmm. Uh, to it as well. There are, you know, it can be appropriated. For example, right, this is a slogan popularized by Abdul Erjalan, the leader of the PKK, but it's being retweeted by the wife of the former Shah, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of different strains within um, the uh, sort of feminist movement, both in the diaspora and, you know, I wouldn't want to say, you know, everybody in Iran is on the same page on what they mean by this. But I think it, it you know, in a certain way, it, it, it does show the kind of transnational nature of these movements and how they affect each other. And I think Zizek's point about uh, the question of Kurdish liberation being connected to the liberation of the whole country is a, a perfectly correct point. There's, you know, there's nothing inherently radical or revolutionary about the Kurdish community. The, the, the existence of a Kurdish left that still has a mass following is as much a symptom of the failures of the left in other parts of the Middle East than it is something mm. inherent to the Kurdish movement. And basically, you know, my opinion is if you are going to like take away women's rights and uh, minority rights like the Kurds, well, you know, s your general liberal democratic rights are going to be not far behind that. And, you know, in a very concrete way, authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, or at least in those countries with large Kurdish populations, those authoritarian regimes, their consolidation of power has taken place through the barbarism in Kurdistan. Whether, for example, in early Turkish history, when you know the 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 suppression of a Kurdish rebellion in the early 1920s became the excuse to clamp down on all opposition, right? Where, for example, in more recent years in Turkey, um, attempts to suppress the elected Kurdish representatives very concretely in 2016 led to the ending of parliamentary immunity for Kurdish deputies. When the coup happened suddenly that parliamentary immunity got lifted for other people. And with the Iranian regime where by, uh, by you know, they fought the war to consolidate their power in Kurdistan. So the road to dictatorship and tyranny in the Middle East goes through Kurdistan. So without uh, the liberation of the Kurdish people, you know, there's not much hope for liberation in general, let alone the road to socialism, even like capitalist democracy mm -hmm. is not, a really viable uh, prospect in those regions without such a liberation. From the Kurdish side, of course, there is always a tenden there, there is a tendency to move to the right and seek national liberation uh, by oneself. But again, from the Kurdish perspective, Kurdish liberation can only happen in conjunction with uh, the liberation of other peoples. The military balance of power uh, and and the geopolitical realities means that any you know, isolated Kurdish rebellion uh, will be either destroyed or will uh, or will be forced to rely on imperial powers to maintain itself. So, you know, for real emancipation, there has to be a multinational movement that seeks to, you know, in a very total way, grant all the different groups, you know, equal rights and sort of, uh, you know, just liberties and freedoms to and diffuse that national question, diffuse the question of, of, of gender liberation, uh, gender rights as well. 
Well, you, you hear it from Gene, y'all. Like, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that's going into these protests. There's a lot of history, a lot of movements, a lot of things that like, well, we don't have the, the full picture because it's being written right in front of us. Um, there's a lot of factors in play that have led uh, to this this upsurge. Um, I want to pivot a little bit, a uh, little indulgent, I, I admit, but I want to pivot a little bit to this very weird tendency that you see in the United States uh, to not be able to deal with the complexity, the social movement, the material reality that people are experiencing in other countries and sees any kind of big moment of social mobilization like this as somehow having uh, the red, white, and blue hands of uh, Uncle Sam behind it. And I don't know if you have this first uh, uh, tweet handy, Matt, but I mean, we could just go through a couple of them. I'm just putting you them up. You want the wrong so, Paul? Whatever one you want. We can just read them both and and and, and cue off from there. Um, it, it, do you know what, what is this? These are libertarians? Yeah, I'm assuming so. Let's see how prominent. Ron Paul Institute, um, 60 thou on uh, Twitter, uh, non-intervention pro-civil liberties, period. Official Ron, this is the official Ron Paul Institute, right? Okay. Um, so You're seeing uh, the Ron, the Ron yeah. Paul boys um, saying every time the CIA wants to overthrow, an, a, try to another overthrow in Iran, it's a young and attractive woman they use as a figurehead. Um, they have hundreds on the payroll to figure out how to gain international approval and support um, for their intentions in, in Iran, and Americans fall for it every time. Um, they're talking here about the, the, the killing of Amini, and I'm assuming they're also lumping in the the green movement, um, you know, where the popular slogan was "Where is my vote?" Uh, when people are pushing back against elections that were very clearly uh, meddled with in in, in the country. Um, why don't we just do them both? If you got the other one handy, Matt, um, because that's yeah. sort of from the libertarian uh, weirdo side. But the people, you you could confuse somebody um, because you're seeing the same things from so-called leftist a- anti-imperialists. Uh, this is from a fellow who does a lefty or calls himself lefty, you know, YouTube anti-imperialist thing, saying a color revolution being fomented in Iran just days after becoming an official member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. U.S. imperialism punishes nations um, forging an independent path uh, with chaos, um, which I'm just going to put my cards on the table. I think is a very disgusting a way to frame uh, millions of people willing to go out and being beaten by the Iranian state, um, demanding that 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 people aren't murdered uh, for not wearing hijab properly. But Gene, I mean, <laughs> I think we have a lot to get into here. Um, but maybe before we get into like the pathologies that make this stuff like exist, I mean, how wrong headed is it to see something like this happening in Iran and only be able to attribute it to maybe American meddling? Well, you know, in a general sense, it is basically just comes to be an inversion of American exceptionalism, whereas, you know, the American exceptionalists see America as an all-powerful state that has the power to shape reality on the ground. Um, If you invert this, you end up saying, well, that's a bad thing, but they are still shaping everything on the ground. This overestimates the competence of the American security services uh, in their ability to reshape reality. Of course, and I think that this must be emphasized, you cannot look at these kind of events in isolation from the global situation. Of course, when you have a spontaneous uprising in a country that is opposed to American interests, the United States will seek to direct or shape that movement. They will seek to influence uh, its outcome. More generally, for example, we might say that, um, you know, American sanctions, the maximum pressure um, policy pursued by the Trump administration, uh, exacerbated the the tensions in the country by creating an economic crisis that could have been averted. Uh, But, you know, at the end of the day, the primary reasons for this unrest should be linked to uh, the internal dynamics within these countries. Mm -hmm. So, of course, American imperialism becomes involved in a lot of things, but often in a confused, in a confused and haphazard manner. Often, um, 
the American empire is subcontracting a lot of these uh, foreign policy adventures to local pro-American powers. If we look, for example, at the Syrian civil war, I mean, the United States were funding groups that were fighting each other, right? The okay. United States was uh, uh, largely working with Turkish intelligence services, for example, to work with opposition uh, groups. The American empire often does not have the information on the ground to shape the outcomes uh, to the ones that the imperial state would necessarily want. Now, of course, within this context, the military industrial complex is always making money. You know, people are like, well, you know, this is all America's plan because everybody's making money. Well, the military industrial complex always makes money. Guess what? Nazi Germany lost uh, the Second World War. But guess who didn't lose the Second World War? The German industrialists who who built the weapons for yeah. that war. They, But Germany still lost. So American imperial policy is obviously going to seek to intervene in any of these crises. But that does not mean that these crises are, are operations organized by the American state. In fact, that demonstrates that people are, you know, don't really understand how American power works. You know, for example, you know, obviously there have been operations that the Americans have been heavily involved in, especially military coups, because when you have a military coup, you have, you know, uh, military peer-to-peer -peer relationships. You're basically, you're not dealing with a popular uprising. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're dealing with a particular arm of the state that, you know, the, the Americans can have influence over. But with a kind of broad-based rebellion like this, um, this is not something that the Americans are, necess are, are, are orchestrating uh, off the ground. And to believe so is just an inversion of American exceptionalism. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, and it has a, there's a lot of pathologies at play here. I mean, look, I think there's no doubt, for example, Trump's maximum pressure campaign, for example, like that played a huge role in the rise of the current government of Iran, which has, you know, wanted to crack down, has wanted to be more strict about, you know, mandatory, ma mandatory hijab in Iran. Um, <laughs> but it's also because those forces exist in the state. Um, you know, they didn't come out out of nowhere. And it also wasn't the intention or maybe who knows um, of, of the U.S. government to put them in place. So like there is an argument, like if you want to make the argument about American policy having a negative role and effect on the daily life of Iranians, you can make that. In fact, I make that. In fact, our guest last week, Saul Rod, makes that all the time, right? And in the same context today, um, I oppose people in the United States who are saying this is a good time for us to get, you know, for intervention, or this is a good time for us to ration up sanctions or things like that. I oppose those pressures too. But to sit there and, and see what we're seeing in, in in Iran right now and completely deny like the, the political reality there, the agency of millions of people who are saying, no, I don't want to deal with this kind of oppression. Do you think that Iranians aren't aware, for example, of... Um, <laughs> of the role that the American empire plays negatively in their country. Like, fuck you. If you think that they're so stupid that they can't like sit here and recognize this, they're going out in the streets because there's something right in front of them that is on a daily basis, making their lives um, unmanageable, killing people, you know, and it's, it's the most human reaction to say no more. And we're going to try to do something about it to deny people that, that, that role in history. And I'll just say on the leftist side, right. You know, what is the role of Iranian people, of their lives? You know, we, you know, we like to talk in the large scheme of history, but we're talking about every day. People wake up. This is their experience. Are they supposed to sit around and wait for like the end of American empire before they do something about the, the conditions in their own country? I mean, it's a ludicrous and really nasty anti-human argument, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree because, you know, I think these people... Uh, a lot of these people on the left have, you know, th they talk a lot about being Marxists, Marxist Leninists, blah, 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 blah. But they have substituted a concept of class struggle, the concept that the proletariat doesn't have a homeland, for elevating anti imperialism to a commensurate status with the class struggle. Mm -hmm. And what I mean concretely by that is, you know, everything becomes about multipolarity. The belief that, well, you know, 
we need a multipolar world to push back on American empire. When in reality, multipolarity is just a reordering of the powers of capitalism into a you know different order. There are going to be some groups that benefit from that and some groups that get squashed by that. But at the end of the day, the system of international capitalism is still intact. You've just had a reordering of the hierarchy of that, uh, uh, that system. So, you know, this kind of uh, analysis basically in the West particularly is a sign of how defeated these people are. Mm -hmm. They see no prospect for revolution or transformation in the core countries of capitalism. So they project their fantasies onto uh, the decolonial struggle. And what they do is they take what was, for example, a strategy of defeat adopted by Lenin in the 1920s when the revolution in the cause of capitalism didn't happen. They take that strategy and turn it into the entire raison d'etre of their movement. So we have these people who end up supporting bourgeois nationalists in counter hegemonic powers. Um, on the grounds that this is anti-imperialism. Well, if you privilege anti-imperialism, you will end up liquidating the left because these bourgeois nationalists, what do they do when they come to power? They destroy the left. Whether They destroy the left within their own countries. Mm -hmm. They either destroy them or elements of the left become co-opted under the rubric of anti-imperialism. So this is, this is nothing more, uh, you know, this is nothing more than, you know, Maoism which Maoism itself, you know, was based on a very particular historical moment, the struggle of, uh, of the pe peasantry. The peasantry doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, and, and, you know, a privileging of the, you know, global south versus the global north. That is not to say that's an illegitimate way of understanding certain economic relations. There's a core a periphery, there's an exploitative relationship. Mm -hmm. But Marxism, is about revolution in the cause of capital, uh, capitalism. The reason, for example, the Bolshevik revolution shifted towards decolonization uh, was precisely to destabilize the countries at the, uh, in the core of capitalism, that these struggles could trigger revolts in the imperial metropoles. Because at the end of the day, you know, let's, you know, what, what happened, you know, what is the program for the these, uh, what is the program for decolonization? Well, it ends up being a program for national economic development and the fostering of capitalism in these countries. That's what the Iranian Revolution ended up mm -hmm. being. Uh, that that's the state is involved doesn't make it socialism. This you know socialism is, doesn't mean the state do something. Mm -hmm. So. And capitalism requires heavy state in intervention in order to lay its foundation. That was true in the early phases of capitalist development, and that is true today. At the end of the day, these these so these countries, these anti-colonial struggles, many of them did crib socialistic ideas from the left. But once the left was destroyed as a political uh, uh, force. Uh, you know, they ended up moving more and more towards the dominant paradigm of capitalism, which is neoliberalism. This is true in uh, like, uh, and so what does decolonization and anti-imperialism become? It becomes idealism. It becomes cultural. Uh, mm -hmm. And this, you know, you can, if you want to draw an analogy, this is exactly what happens with the anti-racism struggle in America, where it moves from being a movement of social justice and being grounded in material and economic uh, transformations to being a question of how many people of color do you have on the executive board of Raytheon, right? Mm. So this, this is like a parallel movement. The left has, uh, so much of the left has given up upon class analysis and come to privilege a kind of uh, third world nationalism, which, they seek to justify through the selective quote, selective quotes from Lenin, uh, but you know, give up on the global, the, the the true core of Marxism, which is this idea of uh, of class 
solidarity across international boundaries. And like, as, as you were saying too, like, I, th I think it's a really important historical point. Like if people are going to import Leninism into this and uh, I'm just going to be completely honest, Gene, maybe you, you disagree with me. I think a lot of these people don't really know what they're talking about when they're citing themselves as Leninist or something like that. But if you read what they're writing, like it was coming out of like a very big worry of the defeat that they were facing because the entire idea of like Bolshevik strategy under Lenin was we're going to hold this shit until the Germans um, have their revolution and then the world revolution is going to commence. Like the idea was like we have to hold this as long as we can until and give our, our comrades in these other countries time for them to have the revolution. And then as you know, more and more signs started to come that, oh, it doesn't look like that's going to be happening there. Um, yeah, it, it took on this this position that if we can poke the bear a little bit more, maybe um, more more openings will come. But, you know, we, I don't know if you said this during this or if this was before, but like, you know, we, we don't actually live in the same kind of imperial system um, that we did in the early 20th century today either. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the peasantry is gone. So Maoism's historical moment has passed. And more importantly, the nation state, which is the political form of capitalism, has become universalized. So there is still a core periphery economic relationship that takes place. But decolonization was a tremendous defeat for the left. Because what I mean by that is not to say that, oh, it would be better if colonial empire still mm -hmm. existed. What I'm saying is that rather than colonial empires being uh, surpassed for some kind of new political form, something that the Soviet Union tried to attempt through you know, a socialist federation of nations, mm -hmm. uh, instead of replacing that system, you just universalized the capitalist political form. And the mm -hmm. nation state is one of the most effective bulwarks against the spread of socialism you know on one hand it makes sure if there is a radical r uprising in one particular country it's like a bulkhead that sh stops the revolution spreading at the same time you know it allows for different you know it allows for competition between nations in a race to the bottom to provide the best conditions for capitalism to exist in so we live in a world in which it is a world of na capitalist nation states Mm -hmm. you, know, you might make the argument that you know you know Cuba and Vietnam or China are socialist states, but even those states are forced to rely on capitalism, which is the dominant mode of production. You know, neoliberalism would not have been possible without the economic transformation in China because that provided you with all the cheap stuff you like in Walmart. So the you know so so, so like we live in a very we live in a different historical era, but we're still trying to draw upon uh you know paradigms which may have made sense in that particular historical moment but do not necessarily make sense today and it's really you know comes down to uh, the fact that the left doesn't know its history that mm -hmm. the left you know doesn't understand the debates that took place and there's been like a kind of intellectual degeneration where everything just becomes, you know, a meme. And so you end up with like, you know, cat person, Stalinist Twitter yeah. handles. and With like Daddy Assad, you know, in the back of the car with you. No, <laughs> exactly. and, and like... I, I I appreciate this because I think it's it's been actually pretty meaty, and I think that like understand the theoretical underpinnings of this stuff um, is 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 critical. But I'm going to throw a little morality into this too, which is just like you know, it also makes you into a little bit of a sicko. Um, like it's a bad political prognosis, but then you're sitting around, you know, defending fucking um, a very clear war of aggression, for example, in in Ukraine, um, very clear brutality in, 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 in Syria. And for what effect? Um, you know, it's not moving us like, like, you know, get what you want. Ukraine is, is conquered and becomes, you know, a territory in the Russian Federation. How in how in any way does that bring us closer to like workers revolution and workers um, working class politics? It doesn't. Um, so what you're doing is as people are suffering under horrific circumstances are sitting around um, 
you know, cheering for for their suffering out of some kind of, I don't know, ironic detachment because you don't see a viability in politics in the United States right now. I mean, it's a it's a really, really sick mental disorder, if I'm being completely honest. Well, I mean, I don't know about people's mental states, but I would definitely say it is. I mean, it's because people are desperate to, you know, Jason, you know, Jason at TIR, you know, makes the point that a lot of so much politics is kayfabe. You know, it's just yeah. picking a side where you have no real effect on and you just cheer for one side. When I look at the Ukraine war, you know, it would almost be nicer if you could like buy one side or the other's argument because then you could cheer someone on and feel positive mm -hmm. about it. But like there's not there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing pleasant about this war, right? It's it's going to end up with Ukraine being pauperized and partitioned between two capitalist powers. And like you said, does that advance anything? I mean, the retreat if, if the retreat of American empire comes in the form of the rise of another capitalist empire, I don't really see that as being, yeah. it is at best, it's not necessarily that it's worse, you know, in any sense of the word. It's just, it's like, it's not any kind of progress. And one of the biggest problems of the left, I think is that, uh, and my uh, my friend Spencer Leonard made this point is that um, they you know the the biggest lie is like cheering on victory uh, cheering on uh, defeat and pretending it's victory yeah like the 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 Second World War was not a victory for the left right it was a freaking disaster right uh, it cost millions of Soviet citizens it uh, it, it you know crippled the Soviet economy, and it led ultimately in the long term to the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union and the, and, and the kind of degeneration of the Eastern Bloc. But yet, we, you know, so many people like, well, this was a heroic victory. Well, you know, it was heroic. Nazism was defeated. But guess what wasn't defeated? Global capitalism. And guess what bounced back from that? Global capitalism. So, you know, we look upon our, you know, it's, I would say the same as like with leftists in America cheering on FDR. Yeah, FDR did some positive things for like working people. True, but what was the cost of that? That was the destruction, destruction of the communist of the movement here. Yeah, the destruction of the left. The left, after the Popular Front, basically, you know, went into coalition with the Dixiecrats. Right? You know, FDR. You know, if we look at this in a historical sense, you know, like there's a lot of discourse about fascism, and you know, but you know, the issue is that. The problem is not fascism, but Bonapartism. And there were like vicious types of Bonapartism, like Hitler and the Nazis. And there are like perhaps more benign versions like FDR. But they're fundamentally the same thing in that they are ways to destroy the left. And that's what these regimes in the Middle East represent, whether it's the Islamic Republic, whether it's Assad's regime, whether it was Saddam Hussein. These were all regimes built on the physical annihilation of the left. You know, in, in, in America, it was like, you know, people lost their jobs. Pe some people were assassinated. Some people were put in jail. But in a lot of these countries, these, you know, these movements, you know, people were, thousands of people were killed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, this is a, a, a failure of Stalinism and the notion that, the, you know, and Stalinism is not because Stalin was a bad guy. It was because Stalin was a product of the isolation of the revolution and the fact that the Soviet Union increasingly had to operate as a nation state in a world of nation states rather than the base camp for uh, for revolution. So yeah, the Stalinists were like, you know what? You guys shoot the shoot the communists so long as you give us a good oil deal or you give us a you know give us a. Uh, a, a base, you know, give mm -hmm. us a military base or support us in our struggle against uh, the third world. So, you know, the left has been on the retreat, you know, since the failure of the German revolution. And we've been deluding ourselves that decolonization was some kind of victory. Decolonization might have provided us with an opportunity for victory, uh, but that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. And decolonization ultimately ended up like the Iranian revolution, a right-wing phenomena. And there are people in, in the West who, rather than 
really thinking about the history of the left, thinking about the theoretical debates pertaining to what it means to be a so socialist. They just invert, you know, they invert, uh, you know, American exceptionalism. They invert the values of liberalism and they come to reject it. Marxism is not about rejecting liberalism. It's about surpassing liberalism and realizing the promise of the bourgeois yeah. revolution. I mean, just look at people in America today. You have these leftists like tearing down uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you have people following Gerald Horn's nonsensical, the 1776 was a counter revolution. Like, uh, like the American revolution was a bourgeois revolution. It was a progressive revolution for all its contradictions and failures, right? Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, was one of the few political leaders that Karl Marx rallied behind. The Republican Party was one of the few parties that Marx saw as a revolutionary force. But because these guys are so like enamored with, um, you know, uh, uh, inverting American exceptionalism, they completely ignore the radical traditions that exists in America and buy in to the kind of America is a conservative nation inherently mm -hmm. ar ar argument which is absolutely non nonsensical and really is just as you know just as the whole american exceptionalism america is the greatest country in the world freedom blah 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 uh, stuff that you know let's say liberals and conservatives buy into this whole you know 1690 uh, 1619 project america sucks the counter revolution of 1776 others that's just the historical narrative for the black middle class who are trying to like guilt trip white liberals into giving them a piece of the pie so that they can exploit their own uh, uh, people. J just like all these like so-called third world leftists with exotic names are basically just, you know, kind of just uh, end up shilling for reaction reg regimes in, in the homeland and doing performative stuff to just show off like look you know i'm 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 a poc yt is bad and look at these pocs it, the, i mean the uh, i know i've been doing a lot of like armchair psychology stuff here but like it really is like a i think um a lot of these like pathologies on the left at least is like the world's ending um the reckoning is happening and we're not going to be able to do anything about it, but I'm going to be the one who dies with the right feeling about things as, as, as it's going down. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, you see this with the degrowth people, right? You know, we've moved so far away from even like the Bernie Sanders, which was, you know, not necessarily like a super radical socialist project, but it revitalized a lot of ideas about class politics in the United States. We moved so far from that five years later, you had people who were all in for Bernie now being like, Americans are fat and they like cheeseburgers too much and their standard of living should decline. And for what purpose? I can't really tell you, but, um, you know, they deserve it. Right. And it's just sort of like, as the punishment from God is coming for our sinful life, um, you know, you can cheer on the, 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 I mean, the, um, the forces that are, are punishing us. It's, 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 it's the, it's the transformation of politics into moralism. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's all you can see it as. And it's just an inversion of like the mainstream moralism that exists. And like I said, everything that's bad becomes good and everything that's good becomes bad. It is not, you know, it's not, it's not dialectics, you know, mm -hmm. it's not a dialectical understanding of anything. It's just, you know, people are mad at daddy, you know, they're like, <laughs> yeah. they're, 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 they're mad that like what they learn in school was a load of old nonsense. So they assume everything that they've been told is a lie. You know, what I would say to people is like, look at the Russia war, right? People, all these people on the left who are like now like supporting Russia in the lead up to the war, they were like, this war is not going to happen. This war is just imperialist lies. Well, guys, like, let me get real with you guys. Sometimes the imperialists tell you the truth, right? The question is not, uh, you know, yes, we have to assess it whether they're lying or not. But when they're telling you the truth, the question is, why are they telling you this truth, right? Mm -hmm. The imperialists are telling us all the time that Iran is so bad with women. That is true, right? The question is like, wait, but why aren't they saying this about Saudi Arabia? Well, obviously, there's geopolitical factors behind it. So, you know, this 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 is what it comes down to. These guys can only think in moral terms. They can't think in class 
terms. You know, they can't think, it, they don't, there's no left for people, there's no real organized left for people to, to, to join and to participate in a movement. So they just sit there and make broad moral pl proclamations and are obsessed with like having the right take. Sometimes, you know, it's not about the right take. Or, or want to paint themselves um, in the aesthetics of, of earlier movements as we're seeing with the whole MAGA communism thing. Um, but Gene, that's a whole other uh, monster. I highly suggest people check out uh, uh, This Is Revolution. If you're not already listening, you should, uh, particularly their recent stuff on Fanon. I think it's going back to the whole decolonization thing. I think people would actually do well <laughs> to maybe familiarize yourself a bit more with Fanon because with Fanon, it's one thing, I will say. So I know I was closing this out, but with Fanon, there's one thing that most people learn about and it's violence. And they're just like, Fanon is the philosopher of violence. Violence is good. And that's why, you know, that's why we like Fanon. It's like, Fanon's argument about the the psychic important of violence is not a small part of his work. Don't get me wrong, um, but boy, you are missing out on a lot of really important um, arguments and 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 parts of his philosophy if you just sort of uh, treat him as a as a, the poet. Of well, yeah, that's like just having read Sartre's intro. <laughs> Yeah, right? that's very true. Which, yeah. ironically, I feel like most people have. And also, Fanon, just historical note, um, was very pissed about uh, Sartre's um, intro. He thought that it was um, not a not a good retelling of of his work. But the reason you have to have Sartre's intro is because at that point in the French state, which was also extremely repressive when it came to free speech, Sartre was such a big figure that you put your name in the introduction, and they can't. They, they were less likely to be able to ban it, which is why it ended up happening. But anyway, um, Gene Pagelon, I appreciate you always so much, um, brother, and we have to do this again sometime soon. Thank you guys for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Gene.